Hello, everyone. I think we've just gone live. Welcome to our next cooling seminar. Today, we're actually going to be introducing cooling as a circular economy. And this, this piece of work ties into a work package within our broader program. We're specifically looking at production networks of cooling and delivery models for cooling that move it towards sustainability and in particular towards circularity. So it's our great pleasure today to be able to welcome speakers representing actually both aspects of this. Um, coming from CARE, we're looking at cooling as a service, as a business model, and coming from Daikin, we'll also be looking at the production processes and sustainability for cooling itself. Uh, my colleague Giovanni, who's the research associate specifically working on this theme, will introduce our speakers for you. And then we'll have a brief introduction from each of the speakers um, before we open it up for a broad Q&A amongst everyone here. I want to just let everyone know before we kick off that we are recording live, so do remember this. And then also please send your questions to us in the Q&A box um, in the bottom of your screen. Um, and that way we'll be able to select them out, um, bring them to the speakers. We can also vote on the ones that are the most popular. So please use that instead of the chat function moving forward. And welcome, Giovanni, would you like to introduce our speakers today? Yes, of course. Thank you, Caitlin, for this. Um, I'm going to introduce first, we have two brilliant speakers, guests today. We have uh, David Makanes, who is the lead of the customer success team at CARE, where he's responsible for delivering CARE's brand experience across the regional cooling as a service portfolio. So as an advocate of the circular economy and the product as a service business model, Dave regularly shares experiences with large multinational corporations and startups who are looking to transition to this disruptive business model. And on, this, on the other hand, we have also today Martin Didix, who is the general manager of the Environment Research Center at Dyke in Europe. He is a member of the United Nations Environment Programme for Refrigeration, Air Conditioning and Heat Pumps Technical Options Committee. Martin was also a lead author on reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was, was honoured by the Nobel Prize in 2007. So it's great to have you both. Thank you and, and welcome. I think we're going to start with the presentation by by Dave, who is going to talk to us about uh, cooling as a service and his care uh, company. Okay, sure. I'll just share my screen, Giovanni. Okay, can you all see my screen okay and hear me all right? Okay, super. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, the invitation to join you this evening or this afternoon where most of you will be. Um, before we get to the Q&A session, I wanted to pose a problem to the audience, uh, and that maybe can help us set a framework for the discussion that we have later. Uh, and if I can get us all to agree on a problem that we should be solving, we can then use the Q&A session to go and try and solve that problem. Now, the problem I'm, of course, referring to is that caterpillars are very slow. I think this is a non-controversial statement. We all know how caterpillars walk. We've seen them look like this. They put their head forward, they drag their body behind them. They then launch their head forward again and drag their body behind them. But it's extremely slow as an animal. Um, they're often referred to as inching forward, crawling, creeping along the forest, uh, and they're not very quick animals. Now, this isn't a very controversial statement. Uh, however, it might be quite a controversial problem. Uh, some of you might be thinking, why have I chosen this to, to solve in this particular webinar? And why do I think it's one of the most important questions we have to solve collectively? So let me just take 10 minutes to provide a little bit of context. We all are aware of Paris 2015. Um, and at that global summit, these global leaders came together and they decided that we would put this goal forward, that we would limit the global temperature rise to 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. And we were going to do that by moving and shifting to a low carbon and climate resilient future. Essentially, we have to use less energy and we need to find cleaner and greener sources to provide that energy. Now, whilst this is a very easy framework to understand, 
some of you might not be so familiar with the importance that cooling plays in achieving this. And essentially, if we get cooling right, we can achieve this. And if we don't, we will miss it. It's very much make or break. So the International Energy Agency put together some data, um, and it was really coined perfectly by the Economist Intelligence Unit, which said cooling alone accounts for 10% of the global electricity consumption. That's today. If inefficient systems are not replaced, the demand is expected to triple in the next 30 years. Essentially, what this means is that our need for cooling is going to increase. We're going to build more schools, more hospitals, more data centers, more offices and shopping malls. And as we do that, the demand for cooling is going to go up by three times. When that happens, if we don't have more efficient systems, then the energy consumption is going to go up by the exact same amount. And it's going to make up 30 percent of the global energy consumption by 2050. So this is the problem that we have to solve for. We can't stop more cooling happening, but we can stop the inefficiency that goes along with it. So in the built environment, in the cooling industry, we looked at all the buildings across the world. And in 2015, we plotted them. Uh, and we saw something that you'd probably be very familiar with. It plots out to a very standard bell shape, bell curve. Uh, the axis that you see on the bottom is cooling performance. So this is the sustainability and the carbon emissions of these cooling systems across all the buildings throughout the world. And it's a very obvious distribution. On the right-hand side, you have the people that get it perfectly and do the best we possibly can in 2015. On the left-hand side, you have people that are really struggling. And in the middle, you have most of us, uh, which are doing OK in terms of those metrics. Now, knowing that we needed to improve the efficiency of our systems, what did we do? Well, in 2016, the best got better. We found new technology and invented new ways of doing things. We had more data, which allowed us to use that to build better systems. Technology and data are the two drivers for performance. And so the best got better. What then happened in 2017 is that the world followed. So all of that data and information and wisdom that was gathered by those guys who were really leading the, the industry then trickled down throughout everybody else. So they all caught up. Also, the technology that was expensive yesterday is not so expensive today because we have new technology that's replacing it. So it now becomes more accessible to more people in the market. Then in 2018, the best got better. And in 2019, the world followed. In 2020, the best got better. And in 2021, the world followed. Very much the movement like a caterpillar. And this is what I mean by the caterpillar effect. It's, we are very slowly creeping down this x-axis and moving far too slowly. Now, the reason most people don't see the caterpillar effect is because we get distracted by things that are shiny. If you look at the bottom right of the slide, in 2015, the benchmark versus the 2021 benchmark, there's been a massive improvement. So we go to conferences and we talk about the massive improvement that we've had, the significant difference that we've made, and how quickly we've made that difference. But if you zoom out, if you're aware of the caterpillar effect and you zoom out and you look at the whole slide, you can see that the vast majority of buildings are still performing worse than the 2015 benchmark. And if you look at the way that we're progressing and the speed that we're progressing, it's going to take about 20 years for them all to meet that, meet that 2015 benchmark. So when I say caterpillars are too slow, 20 years really is too slow. So. It's OK, we've had a report, the IPCC have come out and they said we are failing, we are falling short, but there's still time to act. So in, in just a few weeks in Glasgow, we're having COP26 where we're going to reevaluate the situation and we're going to see what we can do to put us back on the right track, because at the moment we are falling short. Now, I'm going to put my email at the end of this presentation and make it available to you. So I'm going to give you my forecast for what's going to happen at COP um, at later on in November. And I want you to hold me accountable to my forecast. I think it's going to look very much like this. Maybe not Obama, because the, the leadership has changed. But we're going to have world leaders that are going to stand behind podiums. They're going to make motivational speeches. There's going to be lots of green, I assume, in the branding. There's going to be leaves and nature in the branding. We're going to have panel discussions. We're going to have handshakes. We're going to make commitments, pledges, and promises. And when we do that, we're all going to feel fantastic. We're going to feel like we're moving in the right direction because this is very dignified. We're going to see the suits and ties. We're going to see them standing arm in arm, and we're going to think we're going to make a difference. But when you acknowledge the caterpillar effect, when everyone else sees this, actually what I see is this, in that all the world leaders are going to come together, and they're going to cheer on the caterpillar. 
they're going to cheer it on and ask it to go faster. They're going to tell it it can go faster. But it's still a caterpillar. We can't do the same thing now that we did back in Paris because we will get the exact same uh, result and we will fall short. Now, that's a very pessimistic outlook um, on what COP26 is going to look like. But I've used a nice cartoon caterpillar to cheer us all up a little bit. But I do have a solution. And the solution is instead of looking to a caterpillar to get faster or looking to a caterpillar for inspiration, what if we look to something else like Netflix? Now, Netflix is very interesting because if I do the exact same modeling that I did before, and on the x-axis, instead of putting the cooling systems and the performance of the cooling systems, I put their features, their content, and their user interface. And I map out now all of their customers and seeing what level of service they're getting. If I was to map them out, the question is, would it look like this? Would it be similar? And the answer is, of course, no. It doesn't look anything like that. If I were to map out all the customers of Netflix, all of us, it would look like this. A hundred percent of us get access to the latest features, content, and user interface that they've designed. And the reason that is, is because we all log into the exact same Netflix. We all go in on a daily basis and any updates they've made are available to us and we log in and we access them. We get access to the best every single day. So when Netflix, as an example, adds more features or more content, if I was to show you the slide back in uh, July or August, they didn't have Seinfeld. In October, they added Seinfeld. On the 30th of November, no one could access it. On the 1st of October, every single one of us had access to that show. So think about the power of this business model. When I showed you the cooling systems, I told you it's going to take 20 years for the world to catch up to the 2015 benchmark. Netflix did it in 20 hours. Every single person got the update and the features overnight. And that's extremely powerful. And that's what we need to harness. But simply, entertainment as a service is not limited by the caterpillar effect. And cooling as a service isn't either. Now, cooling as a service is a very simple idea. And essentially what happens is you have a service provider who is in the box on the left, and they take care of all of the investment in the cooling system for the buildings that are in that portfolio. They operate those buildings, so service and maintenance, repairs, and utilities, so the energy consumption, and that's a key part all the management and accountability for those cooling systems. And the building owners now, instead of having to figure out where they lie on that bell curve and trying to crawl up it as slowly or quick, as quickly as possible, they can just pay as they use for cool air and they can rely on the cooling as a service provider to deliver all the performance and unlock all those benefits that you saw with the Netflix model. Now, you might think that's a little bit revolutionary. You, you're talking about Netflix and you're talking about air conditioning. Those are two very different businesses. But actually, this is not new. Um, and it's not revolutionary. If you look at buildings today, on the left-hand side of their balance sheet, they have things like electricity and water. We call them utilities. Essentially, that's as a service. They are buying electricity and water as a service today. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, on their balance sheet, you've got cooling, you've got lifts and lights and other building services. So the question is, if Netflix has all those benefits and as a service has all those benefits, and we're doing it anyway with electricity and water, why don't we just move cooling to the other side? And simply by doing that, you solve the problem of the slow caterpillar. So what does that look like? So this is our portfolio. So as mentioned, I come from a company called Care based in Singapore, and we've operated cooling as a service uh, for buildings in Asia for the last decade. And this is what our portfolio looks like. Exactly the same that we looked at before, technology and data are the drivers for, for, for performance. So any building that comes into any cooling as a service portfolio immediately gets access to all the understanding and data and technology that they have available to improve and deliver those systems. Now, I want to show you a snapshot of our portfolio, but I only want you to focus on two parts. One is the bottom left of the screen and the other is the top right. The bottom left shows how many square feet of space we are serving, which is about 10 million square feet of space. Now, that is an extremely small number. If you were to look at the total cooling market and you were to try and put in a pie chart, as an example, and you would put 10 million square feet of space on it, you wouldn't even see it. It wouldn't even show up. But even with such a small portfolio, you can see the impact on the right. 55,000 metric tons of carbon saved every year, a low GWP commitment. So we're moving from the 134A refrigerants over to the 1234ZE refrigerants, moving from GWP numbers of in the thousands down into the 5, 7, 10. Um, and I know that's something that Martin's going to cover a little bit later. 
solar as a standard. We have business parks in India, we have offices and educational facilities in Singapore that are 100% solar. Uh, and we have a circularity approach. So this is something that we'll get to a little bit more in the Q&A session, how by having a portfolio of buildings that you're operating, you can have a re it unlocks a lot of circularity that you can actually put into your design thinking and your operations. So when it, when it comes to the commitments we have to hit that we set out in 2015, we can hit them today simply by injecting uh, buildings into a cooling as a service portfolio. And this, this data is for care, um, but cooling as a service, it, this would be the same for anyone who is delivering this. It is not specific to us as a company, it's specific to the business model. And so the solution to, to the slow caterpillar is cooling as a service and getting as many people into that sort of business model um, as we possibly can. So that's sort of all I wanted to cover before we go into the Q&A. But I wanted to leave you with one thought. Now, about 66 million years ago, a 10 kilometer wide asteroid hurtled through space and collided with our planet. The impact of that resulted in 75% of life on this planet becoming extinct. Now, the poor dinosaurs, well, they met their fate because of a 10 kilometer wide asteroid that they couldn't see. And even if they could, there was nothing they could do about it. Now, 66 million years later, I really hope that we don't meet a similar fate because we refuse to see and prepare for not a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, but a tiny caterpillar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that presentation. Very insightful, some food for thought, Dave. Um, we're gonna move on now with Martin and his presentation, and then we're gonna start the Q&A session. So Martin, please. Just a moment, I need to get the right screen on it. Okay, I hope you all can see my screen properly. And um, yeah, they've, they've brought some issue related to the products and the uh, uh, application and cooling as a service, which is very interesting. And, but from my side in this context, I will bring something more related to the equipments and how the equipments are brought to the market and how the circular economy is. So if we if we look in the total life cycle of a product and and the contribution to the greenhouse gases uh, in that total life cycle, we see that around one percent is coming from raw materials and transport, and the development, production, and sales around zero point four percent. The use phase has two important points: the energy consumption. And if we look at an, as a general energy consumption from electricity, we come around 86% is in the life cycle contributing, uh, is contributed by the energy, 4% by the refrigerant, and end of life, uh, we have again this 9% due to the refrigerant emissions. And then you have, of course, an important point is part is to, to recycle all materials. Uh, that's not only for the CO2 emissions, but it's from a resource efficiency point of view, most important. If we take more closer look to the refrigerant, that was quite an, an important part and also as besides the energy consumption. We see that, uh, for example, in Europe, here you see the F-gas regulation, where we have an HFC phase down process and, and the, the small lines you can see uh, or the reduction and then you see actually the consumption and CO2 equivalents below it. So it is going down and there is a creation of a shortage, uh, artificial shortage of, of actually refrigerants. And then on this slide you can see how the prices went up. Uh, the prices went up uh, even up to more than 11 times 
the uh, price from before this artificial shortage generation. And, and that's very interesting. If, if then you look to this, this is a view from the French situation about a recovery and a reclaim. A reclaim, actually, it's the recycle of the refrigerant. So you see this, this recovery of the waste that's going up of the refrigerant. And here in this curve, you can see how the, the gas regeneration, especially on the HFCs part, how this is following actually the line like you have seen in the previous season, close to the line of the prices. So we can see clearly that, that prices are a driver for the circularity. So if, the, if you look in a circular economy and you have virgin materials and you have recycled materials, those are coming into competition with each other. So here in this slide, you see already that uh, I'm working for Daikin, you know that. And, and as a company, we took already an initiative from before the HFC regulation came in place to make a loop program. It, it was the aim to make a loop between the actually the production of the substance, the production of the equipment, the use phase, the maintenance, and go to recovery uh, by putting even special recovery equipment on the market and then come to a recycle, a reclaim, or not the destruction of a substance, but the a conversion of the substance means that we are actually reusing the substances, not always as a refrigerant, but we also can convert it to other uh, materials that are very valuable and don't need just a simple destruction or incineration. So this loop program has been launched already more than five years ago and is very successful. And actually, we have a group of products where all the refrigerants are covered by a reclaimed refrigerant and the circular economy. Based on that, on that success, we also started in Europe a um, expert meeting and actually it ended up in a round table for the WEEE forum. It's WEEE stands for Waste of Electric and Electronic Equipment, where we brought all the partners together to think about how to come to a better circularity, first of all, of the refrigerants, but also later on, we will have to look to other substances in this, uh, like the total equipment and the materials of, of the cooling equipment. And it's quite a complex, as you can see, it's quite a complex situation. On one hand, we have WEEE companies, which are uh, recycling complete equipment. And uh, on the other hand, we have also installers which are belonging to an association called AREA, and they are bringing these refrigerants to the gas distributors. So there is a double circle, and uh, but at the end of the story, the materials have to come back to the gas suppliers who are cleaning them and bringing them back to the equipment manufacturers. Also, we know that in the market, there is happening a local uh, recycling um, from the installer back to itself or eventually another installer. In order to, to further accelerate this mechanism and to better register the mechanism, there was a live 3R project set up together with the University of Athens and MAT4 and uh, under the LIFE program. And there, there has been set up a retradables platform. A retradable platform is actually where the, if the installer has recovered his gas, he did his first small analysis on the quality, then he puts it on a platform to sell it. And there he gets offers from people who want to get the substances in order to recycle or reclaim them and bring it back in, in the total circuit. So this platform has been set up. And, and one of the issues in the platform was, how do you do this kind of eBay business 
and complying with all the regulations in view of the FGAS regulation, but also the national implementations, tax implementation. So this platform has to be adjusted for every country or region where we apply this uh, retradable system. And that makes it quite complex because uh, Europe is not one in this context. And actually, it's it's more sometimes these national deviations and regulation are more a barrier to trade of uh, actually a barrier to circularity. I call it that the circle is many times broken because the local uh, national regulations are not simplifying this. This was just as a small sample uh, example of refrigerants, but there are more materials in our equipment. So we have steel, copper, and aluminium. Uh, that's not the biggest issue because these materials have a clear economical benefit and a circular economy. Uh, there we already can see that these materials are very much wanted uh, by a lot of recycling companies and uh, the problem there is that there is in the equipment there are also other equipments insulation materials and plastics there is oil in the compressor typically there is some oil and there are some rare earth magnets for there but these materials have no proper circularity or circular economy model so it's very difficult for these recycling companies to get profit from these materials so there we have to be careful because it creates a risk for pollution if this is not properly treated. So some things to think about. What are the measures that we need to take to drive the circular process? Does mandatory recovery work? How to motivate innovation in that context? I've learned over my whole career that some technical prescriptive measures or not supporting innovation, but they are killing innovation. And does the WEEE model of Europe works for the cooling sector? Today, there is a big issue in the cooling sector because the products doesn't seem to come back as expected. Actually, the sales of new products is tremendous higher than the coming back of old equipment. And there is a reason for that, because if we see the lifetime of the equipment, a lot of equipment has a lifetime of 15 years or more. And uh, it's quite logic if we look to the market of that kind of equipment 15, 20 years ago, when we look to today's market, well, probably it's a fact at 10. So it's not unlogic logic that the amount that is coming back is quite smaller than the sales of new equipment. And then this cross-border regulation for waste and end-of-life equipment breaks the circle. For a lot of countries we have seen, it's very difficult to set up facilities because the market is too small for them for the amount of materials coming back. And where there is such a thing, there is a very low competitiveness. Only one company is doing it and they have no competition. So it makes that innovation is not very needed in order to compete and having a good business. That's all the thoughts. And with that one, I would like to go to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Martin, for that presentation. A very interesting uh, uh, room for questions from the audience. Um, I think we'll be joined now with, for, with my colleague, uh, Caitlin. We're going to move into the Q&A session. We're going to moderate some of the questions there. Great. Thanks so much, Sylvan. Um, thank you both, Dave and Martin. I think you gave us both a really interesting grounding into the work that you've been doing into two very different spaces where circularity can be applied to cooling a circularity concepts for a more sustainable future involving cooling. And I've started to see we've got some great questions coming in and I'm gonna 
take a slight moderator's prerogative to say that as part of the future of sustainable cooling program, we're really looking at cooling as an entire system. And in other webinars, we've addressed elements that involve passive approaches to cooling and effects on health and a wide variety of issues. And today, while we're nonetheless focusing on the production and delivery of active cooling, I want to encourage our dialogue to keep thinking across these boundaries from the sourcing and production of our cooling project products to then how they're used in society. So a lot of your questions have come in on you know, one aspect or the other, and, and I might try to be bridging some of the gaps here between the pieces and how we see them. So one of the first questions we have here, and I think um, I'm going to draw out because it looks well to structure our discussing discussion is going to you, Dave, and it's looking at how do we scale cooling as a service? And I might even write in a second question in that that talked about the example of Netflix is sort of one leading provider, but for cooling as a service, if you're going to have a whole variety of providers, that doesn't work if it's not a monopoly. Yeah, I, thanks. That's a great question. I think you're, you're right. There are differences between the Netflix model when you apply that to, to buildings in different parts of the world. There needs to be multiple providers of cooling as a service. Now, you're not going to have one person taking over the entire market because they are generally in different markets. Uh, so you might have providers in Asia, you have providers in the US, you have providers in Europe, etc. But in order to compete in the cooling as a service world, you all need to meet a certain level. So when, when I showed you that slide on how we offer cooling as a service, you can see that the CapEx and OpEx to run the cooling systems were all under the preview of the cooling as a service provider. So if you're getting a fixed fee from your customers, in order to make that financially feasible, you need to reduce your CapEx cost and your OpEx cost, which you do in a couple of ways. One is you reduce the amount of equipment you're buying and installing, so you're not being wasteful when it comes to how you design. And the second thing you're doing is you're using as little energy as possible and moving to 100% solar where you can. So all of these companies will come up together um, and will work, I think, and collaborate with each other to bring the cooling as a service business model to the world. But then in terms of having great companies, not so great companies, they will all have to come to a certain level in order to compete in the same marketplace. So actually what you'll find is that all these providers will come to a very significantly high level um, very, very quickly because they need to, to, to compete. I mean, Netflix adds features and content all the time because they need to get more users. Um, you said there's only one Netflix, but as an example, if I chose Spotify and Apple Music, there are two providers and they're always competing and trying to be better to, to attract more customers. So I think that's that's essentially what you'll have. You'll have an ecosystem throughout the world of guys that are collaborating. Um, in terms of how you scale, um, what we're trying to do is figure out how do we get more awareness around the business model? Um, how do we get more people involved in it? And one thing that we've really focused on is how do we support global organizations that can drive the proliferation throughout parts of the world where we even aren't there? So the Cooling as a Service Alliance uh, was actually established a few years ago, and we're a founding member of that and a supporter of that. So we feed information into that organization, which then feeds it out globally to other providers, vendors, uh, and people that are looking to, to move into the business model. That's great. Thanks, Dave. So now, actually, the next question, I think, is kind of related to this, was actually asking, this one's going to come to you, Martin. But how do you actually scale and change your portfolio of products to those that only include low global warming potential refrigerants? And I guess maybe if you could start to answer this, Martin, but then Dave would talk about if, if the lifetime, as Martin was saying, of an individual product is usually about 15 years, how do you update and upgrade your portfolio quickly of the appliances that you have in use for your services? So if that makes sense, Martin. We'll come to you first on this question. Yeah. Of, of course, we are we are continuously updating our portfolio based on the needs, and uh, uh, we are looking always to the solutions that are required. and And it's not it's not an easy task. If there would be clear solutions with the low global warming potential refrigerant, I think we would have used it already for many years. Yeah. We are not we are not looking for high GWP substance. We are looking for materials that are uh, fitting for the purpose of the equipment. Yeah. And um, finding a refrigerant with a low GWP and fitting for all these applications is not so simple. So the industry is working very hard on this. 
In the meantime, it is very important to guarantee that there is a proper recovery and uh, and as much as possible a circular a circularity on these refrigerants. And you have seen in one of my slides that for some of the aspects there is a conversion. It means that you can convert the material, but you are not wasting the basic molecules. So that's also very important. And and what what was raised also then in in the aspect of circularity as an equipment manufacturer may be coupled to cooling as a service. Once cooling as a service may come up, there may be a complete interaction, different interaction between the manufacturer and the owner of the equipment, being the company offering the cooling as a service. Because you may come to a kind of remanufacturing of the equipment rather than just selling it and for the next 15, 20 years it isn't there in the market. Uh, big, large components may be completely reused, probably. Um, also, there may be an interaction between the equipment size and the best fitting for the building. Yeah, that's uh, we have done a lot of research also in how much energy you can save by monitoring the building or the actual operation of the equipment and probably replacing the equipment by a better fitting equipment. And that's only working in a mechanism as cooling as a service or if it's for heating, heating as a service with the same system. I hope this gives an answer to your question. Your, your, your mic is on mute, okay. A happy trigger finger, I've undone it and redone it. Um, no, I was gonna say thank you, Martin, that's great. I think. I might just even flip it back to you, Dave, and say, am I really interested in this proposal about how do manufacturers and cooling as a service providers come to work together more in the future? And how do you see that trajectory forming for, for your business at CARE? Yeah, I think there's there's a real close collaboration that has to be, has to be found because <clears throat> the manufacturers are involved in the cradle to cradle on both ends. So how do you get the new innovation, the new technologies and the new refrigerants? And then once they come to the end of life, how do you uh, dispose of them or reuse them or put them into a circular system like, like Martin has been mentioning? In the middle, the cooling as a service provider has to do two things. One is they have to extend the life as much as possible and mitigate the environmental risks whilst they're in use. So <clears throat> as an example, when we have chillers coming into our systems, after maybe 15 or 20 years, maybe they're not so efficient anymore. Um, so they're, they're going down to the lower end of that bell curve spectrum. So actually, because we have a portfolio based approach, we can take those out of active duty and we can use them as standby machines. So you have to have standby in case some of your machines go down. But generally, they're not running. They're waiting to be used. So we can take some of those older machines, we can put them in standby positions so they're not actually um, used um, unless there's an emergency and you have to bring them into the into the equation. Also, Martin touched on you have to be fit for purpose for the building. Um, this is where cooling as a service providers have an advantage over building owners. Um, and it's because of a portfolio based approach. So let me give you an example. Uh, during the last two years, we had data centers, we had manufacturing facilities uh, that really increased their requirements for cooling. Um, as you can imagine, we were all at home watching Netflix. We also had other buildings like offices and shopping malls where the cooling requirements went down and decreased. So we had a data center where the load essentially went up by three times in an eight month period, which is, is unheard of. So what they had to do is because of the space restrictions on their rooftop, they will have to take rid of all the chillers and remove them and put on brand new chillers, which were uh, larger in capacity to serve their new requirements. Now those would all be totally wasted or scrapped or recycled, but there was no value to them as a business because they now needed more cooling, they needed new equipment. Whereas as a cooling, as a service provider, what we can do is we can remove those smaller machines, deploy them throughout our portfolio because we have other um, which have less requirements, and then we upsize with new technology. So essentially what we're doing is we're always putting new technology into our portfolio. We're moving it around the portfolio and, and managing it in the most sustainable or responsible way. And then that's where we need to really work with, with uh, companies like Martin has been mentioning. How do we then bring them out of service in the most responsible way possible? And that's where the manufacturers and some of these um, 
these forums and discussions that Martin was talking about are so important. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. I think it ties into actually one of the other questions we have that's come through on the chat, which is asking about how do you get existing um, cooling service providers to transition to a cooling as a service model? And I guess some of the ways I'd maybe like to expand this is also to, to draw you in, Martin, and talk about, well, how do you get other producers and manufacturers to think about the benefits of switching to producing sustainably and engaging in circularity networks when at the moment, perhaps, I don't know, this is where we'll get your input, but is it an expense to the company or is there, is there a business and, and cost opportunity here for you? And what are some of the business values of doing it? Um, maybe we'll work in that order, Martin, if you want to speak to how do you get more producers of cooling products on board with becoming circular and then Dave will come back to you. How do you get the, the providers to move towards circularity as well? That would be great. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. It's um... It's not a simple task to get everybody on board. It's uh, it's quite complex. You have seen it's not only other manufacturers that are involved. It's all people who are in the circle involved: installers, um, producers of of the materials, being in that case the refrigerants. For this example, it's not a simple a simple exercise and. What is the benefit for our company, you are asking? Well, it's one of our corporate philosophies to look on this sustainability, circularity as a very important point. So if, if we look on the long term and if we would look as an industry, it is extremely important that we are looking to a circular economy. We have limited resources on the planet and um, it's it's a philosophy of the company yeah do we get a lot of benefit on this in the short term not at all because we are spending a lot of resources to get other people around the table we are spending manpower and and doing research on this and we are trying to move a lot of people but we are believing that on the long term it will be beneficial for the company to do such an activities it will be essential to survive in the business. And that's it's not easy to get other, also other companies on board because you really need uh, to have a long-term vision on that one. It's not, we don't talk about a return on investment for this on five years. That's, we're speaking about much longer terms. You have seen maybe also our vision 2050. Uh, well, that's a vision 2050. That's not short term. You are again on mute. Uh, OK. Very sticky button there, I have to say. I'm there, I do. I was going to say thank you. No, it's really helpful. And it, it also, but it did trigger to me this image of Dave's caterpillar saying it's a long term vision what are the quick wins or are there quick wins by changing some of the delivery models dave and how do other companies get involved so maybe i don't know i might be asking too much of you on this question but if there's an answer you think go for it no i, I think I, I agree with with martin's point and I, I think just to elaborate further on that you know if you don't move to a as a service business model or a circular business model you will be out of business and it, and it could be quite quick that you that you go out of business um you know, we, we look at aligning our businesses with the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, and a lot of people will come to conferences and say things like, well, the UN Sustainability Development Goals, they're great for business. They're really positive for your business. And that, to be honest with you, I don't think is true. We, we say that because we wished it was true, because if it was true, we would all take more action in terms of sustainability and circularity. The issue is, unless you happen to be a solar provider, they're not massively good for your business. I mean, if you operate offices or shopping malls, you have negative impacts on the environment by running your business. So if you want to improve that and become more circular, generally, you have to take resources out of your core business and move it into becoming, figure out how to become more circular or sustainable. But the thing is with the UN SDGs is they are not business goals or business objectives. They are humanitarian goals. Now, another word for a humanitarian goal, if you want to be a bit cynical about it, is a customer insight. 
you know, the UN basically did the largest market research study ever done in every market, um, looking at all different types of consumers, which is all of us. And they told us the 17 things that people care about. So if you're a business and you don't align yourself to circularity and sustainability, which is the UN SDGs, you are going to be out of business because your consumers will be demanding that. And if you don't follow them, you won't have overlap between your products and services and what people care about and what people value. So, so I think you're right. It is a long term goal. So we've been doing cooling as a service now for a decade. Um, so, you know, you may not have heard of us before. We've been doing it for 10 years. It takes a long time. Um, but we are seeing we're moving to this tipping point and we are seeing that the benefits of the model are attracting more customers. And in terms of how you how you get more people involved. I've mentioned the Cooling as a Service Alliance already. There are toolkits available. There are roadmaps of how you do this. So the learning that some of us have done doesn't need to be redone um, and more people can be can be moving into the business model. Thank you. Well, that's great. This We have another question here that I think this helps us bridge into, which is asking about how do we think about using Cooling as a Service in rural areas or more remote areas? And I guess that, I'm gonna, again, take the liberty of expanding this, but to say that we have you know, a lot of the growth of cooling expected globally uh, is going to be in areas that are experiencing rapid urbanization and rapid, rapid economic growth. Is there an opportunity to leapfrog the technologies we have or the approach to cooling that we have for cities of the future um, as well? So I guess it's a, a new cities of the future question and a rural area off the grid question. How do we approach sustainable cooling? Um, Martin, you're smiling. Maybe we'll we'll give Dave a break since he just finished. If you want to go first here, I'm thinking that's small. Oh, no, 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 I, I give Dave, you can go first there. Um, okay, it's a great question. I mean, it, we can't just sit and talk about benchmarks and, and the sparkly case studies. We need to look at how we're going to put this um, into practice globally. Um, and rural areas, areas is a challenge. Um, there are two things that, that you can look at. One is absolutely you can be pro. Um, our first 100% solar and 100% water renewable site was in Pune, India, about two hours outside of Mumbai. It was not <clears throat> in Singapore. Um, it wasn't in the US or in Australia. Um, it was in a business park. Um, and we used that by buying solar as a service uh, and then daisy chaining that business model with cooling as a service. Uh, and that was the most reliable way to get electricity to the site and the most sustainable way to do it as well. So in some of these areas where you're seeing mass development, you do have the luxury of space um, and solar can really come into it. And all the technology that we've, we've got can go into those. You need to get accessibility to technology and data into those markets. In terms of some of the more rural um, applications, there's a company called Cold Hubs actually, which is looking at um, cooling and refrigeration for farmers in Africa um, and how they can get their products into a cooling as a service cold hub so that their produce doesn't go bad before they get it to market. Um, and that is solar powered. There's some of these mini container boxes that are solar powered, uh, cooled, uh, and they pay as they use for all the produce these farmers put into these boxes. Um, and it's transforming their livelihoods um, and there's no impact uh, to the environment. So there are lots of little case studies out there that show you can do it on a large scale in a business park or on a very, very small scale, a small um, you know, market setting in, in Africa. Um, they're also looking at using it for cold chain distribution for COVID, va COVID vaccines um, and things like that. There are many, many examples, um, and I'd be happy to to sort of share them or, or spend more details, um, spend more time talking about it if people want to contact me offline as well. Well, I'd like to add something on this, and 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 they've raised it already. It's uh, the the combination of cooling needs and and solar energy by photovoltaic energy is matching quite well. So. Cooling, cooling is not so unstain, unstain, sustainable. It's quite sustainable, and there are technologies by combining photovoltaic energy with the cooling needs and uh, some short-term energy storage that's also available can create a very good solution for the cooling needs. This is a uh, this is not the same for heating needs, yeah. <laughs> But cooling, cooling looks, to my opinion, much more sustainable than heating, if we look on, on comfort and uh, needs on that one. So, and yes, there are coming a lot of uh, new ideas and uh, new uh, proposals for the cooling. But actually, these solutions should be able to compete from a resource point of view 
with these existing solutions, like the combination of cooling and photovoltaic, cooling equipment and photovoltaic. And we have to look to the, to the resource of these solutions, how much materials are used, because that will come very important for our future. What materials and how much materials are used to, to create the need? Right, right, yeah. Okay, there we go. Interesting insights from both. I think I want to just follow this up because one of the, the questions also is we could, we've been talking a lot about incentivizing sustainable pooling and circularity from a business perspective. What policy, regulations, other incentives are needed to support this transition um, that you need from, from governments, from cities, um, and from other sectors as part of the pooling system? Yeah, I, I I put it one of my in my last slide. They put it some questions on this. What we should do? Of course, we have seen, for example, that a substances that are not so good on climate impact, like HFCs with a higher GWP refrigerant, uh, high GWP impact. Um, if if we are doing an artificial uh, shortage generation, we see that the circularity is going up dramatically. On the other hand, we have seen in the industry, for example, plastic pellets for the for making new plastic material or components. Um, they they have a duty to be recycled in Europe, for example. You have to recycle the, refri the plastics, and then you get the pellets from recycled. But what we ended up by a lot of plastic pellets in the warehouses because they cannot compete with the virgin material. So what mechanism do you need to take without taking any technical prescriptive requirements or putting rules that you cannot control like the amount of uh, let's say recycled plastic and a component it's very difficult to control this especially if you import it from outside your region so what kind of rule should we take so you need to look at from an economical viewpoint what kind of economics shall you put behind your measure or your rule so that you create an advantage for recycled materials. That's the only way to do it in a logic way and an automatic driven way. The other the other methods need too much checking by governments and, and they cannot do it. They cannot do it. Okay, great. So a, a big vote for the economic incentives from Martin here. Dave, how about you? So I think when, when you talk about policy and regulation, um, that's the way we cheer on the caterpillar. Um, that's how we stand behind him and try and push him a little bit faster with policies and regulations. Now, I think at the head side of the caterpillar, if you're moving to a new business model, regulations and policies don't drive innovation. There was no policy requirement that made Netflix sustainable or take the market by storm. There was no regulation which allowed Spotify to disrupt the music industry. There was no regulation which allowed Office 365 to flourish. The, the business model is where the innovation lies and that takes care of itself. So you move everyone up to the best and essentially it goes from there. And, is the, and actually the more people that go into that service, the quicker and more uh, rapidly it improves. The more users of Netflix, the fast, the more money they have for technology and the more data they have. Those are the two things, like I mentioned before, that drive innovation. So I think policy and regulation is never going to drive you away from the Caterpillar. Um, but where it is helpful, I think, is if you have the Caterpillar effect that is currently largely uh, found ar around the world, you can try and try and shift this bum forward a little bit. Um, by you know putting together these these um, regulations which say you need to improve against a certain benchmark. Um, if you think of benchmarks, you've got the top end and you've got the bottom end. Policies and regulations help the bottom end move up. Great, thank you. So we have we have just five minutes left, and we actually have a couple of sort of more technical questions that are getting some traction here on our chat. And, and Dave, actually, two of them are for you in the first instance. So I don't know if we can maybe frame this as a little bit of a, a rapid fire. 
Um, so one of them that's coming up is, what do you think is the ideal coverage area size for a cooling as a service company? On a project by project basis, it can be 50 square meters. Um, in terms of a company, I mean, you, you should be looking at the highest GFA coverage you possibly can in a particular market. Um, so it, it is very varied. Um, so I'm not sure if I answered that question, but it, it works on a project by project basis at any gross floor area. Right. And then second sort of rapid fire here is what are the projections you have for the possible total reduction in electricity consumption that CAS could provide, say in 2030 or in 2050 compared to business as usual? Okay, that, that's a great question because it, it relates back to, I think, my first slide on uh, limiting the global temperature rise to 2 or 1.5 degrees. You have to reduce your energy consumption and you have to find the energy from renewable sources. In terms of reducing the energy consumption, if you are working with a building that's at the back end of the Caterpillar, you can bring them straight to the front. Um, and you can do that in six months. Actually, you can do it in four now, but it takes about four to six months to retrofit the system. And the, the financial feasibility models mean you should do it as quickly as you possibly can. So you can actually improve by three times in terms of efficiency and sustainability in four to six months. In terms of hitting those sustainable goals, we now have access to solar energy. So you can do that today. So yeah, you should be, depending on how many you inject into the portfolio, four to six months to improve the technology. And then you work from there in terms of making it more sustainable with renewables. Okay, great, thanks. So we're just about to close, but I want to give everyone their last words, if you will, last chance to sort of fire something back at the audience. And I mean, it's been our great pleasure today to talk across the really wide range of issues that we've brought up. But as we close out, I want to just bring it back to each of you, to Martin and Dave. Do you have a final summary comment, word of wisdom, thing you're most excited about? What's your parting message to our group before we sign off here? Um, Martin, do you want to kick us off? Do you have a thing you're most excited about, thing to bear in mind as we look forward to circular cooling? Well, yeah. I, I think that the industry is very much aware that there is a need for circularity in this business. So there is a big growth, first of all, in the business. The, the, the demand for cooling, especially in regions like uh, Southeast Asia, but also African region, South American region, will, will increase drastically. If we, we really want to survive as a society, we have to look to circularity. There, is not, there are not enough resources in the planet if we don't look to the circularity. And I think uh, large manufacturers are very much aware about that need and they are preparing themselves. Um, look to what happened with the prices of copper and aluminium over the past months and year. This is not a one-time case. It will become more and more important to prepare us to use less resources, first of all, and secondly, to make them circular. All right. So we need to be circular to survive. I like this as a, as a good takeaway. Dave? So sorry to sound a bit like a broken record, but please stop cheering on and being inspired by a caterpillar pace. Um, a caterpillar will not get faster. It cannot go any faster, no matter how much we want it to. It's wishful thinking. Um, and that may be pessimistic, but there are options available. We don't have to continue. Even though we've continued this way for a long time, it's not too late to change. Um, that was the, the, the comments that came out of the IPCC. That's the, the, um, the rallying call for COP26, which is happening in Glasgow. But it was also the rallying call in Paris in 2015. So we can't say the same thing. We have to change what we're doing. Um, we don't have to be limited by a caterpillar pace or the caterpillar effect. We can move to the as a service business model and essentially hit that 1.52 degrees that we need to, um, to to carry on. Brilliant. Thank you both. Well, thank you for joining today with the insights from your personal experience and from your companies. And yeah, we all, I guess, look forward to change in the future, um, both in the lead up to COP and hopefully quickly and long time beyond it. So thank you all for joining us today as well. 
I think you have some contact details uh, for both Martin and Dave. They've been interested to in touch a bit more. And then also continue to watch our webinar series, please. We'll have another session weekly in the lead up to COP discussing different aspects of how to make cooling sustainable for the future. So thank you so much and have a good afternoon or evening or morning. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you all Thanks so much. Thank you, bye. Thank you for the discussion.